It's time for ROTD Weekend. It's not really a secret in my household that I'm not the hugest fan of Halloween. My theory is that candy bars aside, Halloween doesn't have a lot to do with food or not a lot to do with cooking. And so it's just not one of my favorite holidays. I like the holidays where you cook a lot. Having said that, though, I am enjoying the lead up to Halloween way more this year. And it is not because I am leaving on the 30th, the day before Halloween, to meet up with my parents in Florida. That is not why. It is because we have this exchange student from France staying with us. It's a short exchange program. He's just here for 10 days. And then my son will be going there to stay with his family in March. But yeah, so we have this extra person here who doesn't really celebrate Halloween. It's not a big deal in France. And the fall traditions are a little bit different. And so it has been super fun, almost like when my kids were little, going to like the pumpkin patch. We are carving pumpkins tonight roasting pumpkin seeds. I've got a pumpkin pie in the oven baking right now. I usually only make them for Thanksgiving, Canadian Thanksgiving and American Thanksgiving. But this year I'm also making one for tonight because Esteban, our exchange student, has never had pumpkin pie before. And so it's going with the pumpkin carving theme. We're going to a party and we're getting all dressed up and we're doing it in theme too. So it's just been super exciting and I've been enjoying it way more than usual. And I think it's just because there is somebody new to share with for whom it is all new and exciting. And it's also making me realize that I have something even more exciting to look forward to. So yes, I am heading to Florence in just a couple of days. I am meeting up with my parents there. What has happened is they are there for a whole month and they realized before going a long time ago that the Airbnb they were booking had an extra spare single room with a little single bed in it. And they asked if I wanted to come just on my own to spend a week of their vacation with them. And I said, Yes, of course I said yes. And so it just turns out that I'm going for pretty much their last week. And so I think what's been going on, and I can tell from their messages to me, is they are doing their stuff, they are having a great time, but sort of threaded through their experiences and their conversations is a lot of, oh, I think Christy's going to like this, or oh, we should go there with Christy. Yes, they call me Christy. That's something that should be known for this conversation with you here. I am Christine to just about everyone in my life now, but to my family and to people who I went to like high school, junior high with. I am Christy. So that is what they call me. So they are wandering around Florence saying, oh, I wonder if Christy would like this. And I think what that's going to mean for me is that they have already scoped things out and they've got some great plans for me. But also I think they're going to get to like re-see Florence, you know, the way that I'm getting to redo Halloween with Esteban, they are going to be going through Florence and having this great time and then I'm going to get there and they're going to get to see it through my eyes and sort of do it again and make their holiday even better, which I think is just great. It's like win, win, win for everybody. I am super excited about it. Exchange students from France, Halloween, heading off to Italy, lots of exciting stuff going on, but also that thing where some Somebody gets to share something new with somebody else and that makes it brighter and better as well. That is happening on this show too, because as you know, our guests now are bringing with them a recipe that is a surprise to me. So on Saturday afternoons, you and I get a surprise recipe of the day with a special guest making it even more special and exciting, right? And today's guest is really, really fantastic. I am talking with Amy Katz of Veggies Save the Day. Amy is a certified vegan nutrition health coach, and she specializes in a vegan Mediterranean diet. She is the blogger and recipe developer behind VeggiesSaveTheDay.com, and she is here today to share a surprise recipe of the day with us. Let's listen. Welcome back, Amy. Thanks for having me, Christine. I am so happy to see you again and happy to have you on this show again. Can you start by telling me a little bit about your your food website and your general like cooking philosophy? I know a little bit about it already, but we'll share with everybody else. 
Yeah, that sounds great. So I'm Amy, and I share easy vegan Mediterranean diet recipes at Veggie Save the Day. And my philosophy is that you don't have to be vegan or vegetarian or plant-based to enjoy my recipes. They're really for everyone, and especially for those who want to add more things like vegetables and leafy greens and beans and legumes to their routine. So as I say, everyone is welcome at Veggie Save the Day. I love that. And it, it's so true, right? Just because you have dietary restrictions or there's things that I don't eat or can't eat, that doesn't mean that we can't have a meal together and enjoy the same foods, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I found um, recently there's been some renewed interest in kind of a plant based or vegan Mediterranean diet. And especially with the recent docuseries that came out on Netflix um, that's called Live to 100, that's about the blue zones. And um, Mediterranean um, diet is from a lot, you know, different areas in the Mediterranean, but it does overlap with a lot of the Blue Zones philosophy, um, because two of the Blue Zones are in Italy and Greece. So a lot of the food philosophy, and it's really, you know, really a lifestyle philosophy, a lot of it is very similar. So it's all about, you know, eating with the seasons, and using a lot of um, herbs and seasonings, and, you know, going with the basic foods, like a lot of fresh produce, or, you know, even even frozen produce is fine. But you know, a lot of produce, um, heavy vegetable based and a lot of beans and legumes, nuts and seeds. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, again, those those herbs and seasonings that really um, bring your dishes to life. Oh, yeah, that sounds so wonderful. And that is I mean, you know, if you have lots of fresh produce, you've got some herbs, some little crunchy nuts or something on top, like that's just delicious food, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you have a recipe to share with us today. I don't yet know what it is. It is it's time to surprise Christine. So uh, yeah. I, I need to get like a drum roll sound effect. I'm just gonna drum my <laughs> notebook here. <laughs> what is the recipe you're telling us about today, Amy? So today, Christine, I'm excited to tell you about my recipe for red lentil potato soup. Oh. And this is kind of that classic combination of pulses, you know, which lentils are a pulse, and along with a starch, which in this case is potato, and then leafy greens, which in this case, we're going to be using kale. I love but kale. Um, yeah, and you know, and the great thing about soups, too, is that you can really vary the ingredients based on what you have on hand. So I'm going to tell you about the basic uh, recipe that I use, but you can feel free to customize this based on on, excuse me, whatever ingredients that you have on hand mm -hmm. in your kitchen at the time, or, you know, whatever vegetables are in season. It sounds really good. Um, can I ask you lentils? You said they're a pulse. What do you know? Yes. What a What is a pulse? Exactly? Yeah, so a pulse includes beans, lentils, and peas. Okay. So there are um, ingredients that, you know, are really high in fiber and protein, and they keep you satisfied for a long time. Love that. And red, you said red lentils specifically. So I think yes. we're mostly familiar with like green or beige-ish colored ones. Yeah, They sell red exactly. ones at like every store, right? Right, right. So red lentils are one of those ingredients that isn't used as much um, commonly as, like you said, the green or the brown lentils. But what makes the red lentils different is that they're softer and they cook really, really fast. So when you see them in the store, they're kind of like a bright orange color. And then when they cook, they become really soft and break down a little bit and they become like a yellow color. And they're particularly good for things like soups and stews because they do break down and they almost, you know, become absorbed like in the soup and they take on the flavors of the broth. Whereas your um, other lentils, like brown and green lentils, they hold their shape. Mm -hmm. So they keep that round shape and they stay firmer. So mm -hmm. a lot of people that think they don't like lentils, they do enjoy red lentils because they do have that di different texture. So is it going to be the texture of like a split pea soup in the end? Does it kind of do that? 
Yeah, it's very similar to split pea. That's and you said, I just want to make sure I heard you. You said that they change color when they're cooked. So they, you buy them, they're red, yeah. and it's going to make like a yellowy colored soup? Yeah, exactly. Oh. So they're they're called red lentils, but they're really more of a bright orange color. And then as you as they cook, you can tell they're ready because they become yellow. This is so exciting. Okay, I am ready to hear how to make this soup. Where do we start, Amy? Great. So first thing we're going to want to do is start by sauteing some onion and then adding some fresh garlic and carrots and celery. So you get that classic combination to start and it's really flavorful and aromatic. Um, So it's a great base for the soup. So what oil do you use when you're sauteing? You wouldn't use butter, of course, because you're doing no, vegan. No, so yeah. this, that's a great question. So we're going to use olive oil. Okay. So that's typically what's used um, in a Mediterranean diet. And if you don't have olive oil, um, avocado oil is a great substitute. So you're going to start with like a soup pot kind of thing with a tablespoon yes. or so of olive oil, like one onion, two, yeah. two carrots, and two stalks of celery about? Yeah, yeah. And then for the garlic, you know, I would say at least two cloves. But you know, if you're if you're like me, you might want to do three or four cloves. Yeah, I always, you know, yeah, I always double the amount of garlic called for in other people's recipes. But I've been hearing enough people say that lately, that we're going to come to the point where everybody's recipes have already been doubled. And then we're like doubling the double, you know? Yeah, that's so, funny. so a few cloves of garlic going in there. Okay, what's next? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, then we're going to add some vegetable broth, about four cups. And you can either use, you know, your homemade vegetable broth, or you can use it from a carton. Or what I like to do is buy that better than bouillon mm. that comes in a jar. And it's sort of like a paste. And you just add that along with water and it forms a really flavorful broth and it's you know it's just an easy way to keep that on hand um, and it's ec- more economical than buying the cartons but of course if you have homemade broth you know that's that's the best oh, yeah, um, sure. but you know I don't always have that on hand although I probably should <laughs> no I, I I don't do it either you know what I do love though you said four cups right mm-hmm. that is the amount in a carton so if you do have yes. a carton I, I love when I see a recipe that calls for four cups of stalker broth. I'm like, thank you so much because now yes. I don't have like a three quarters of a cup of broth in a carton in my fridge, right? So okay, so a Absolutely. carton or make up Absolutely. your own better than bouillon. Yeah, or you know, and- what? I don't know. There, uh, we don't have a sponsor right now for this show, but we've had a brand called Zoop Good, really good as oh. a sponsor, and they make a delicious culinary concentrate very similar to the better than bouillon oh. one really really nice so people can yeah look for that, that would as be well. good too mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. so then along with the broth we're also going to add our potatoes and for this recipe and for most soups i really like to use the yellow potatoes um the ones that you know sometimes you see them sold as yukon gold mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i think those are really nice in a soup because they you know we're dicing them up but they do hold their shape when they're cooked and they don't take long to cook um you could also use red potatoes or you know your basic white potatoes i would say i recommend against using russet potatoes in in soups because they tend to get really mealy and kind of mushy Mm -hmm. and it's just not a very nice texture Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. the yellow potatoes are nice and creamy and they do hold their shape oh that's a good tip i i hadn't thought about that do you know does that go along with like the difference between a floury potato and a waxy potato do you ever hear people talk about that yeah, yeah. So I think these are more waxy potatoes. So they what that means is that they tend to have a lower starch level, mm. whereas something like a russet is high in starch. So those are great for baking or making like, you know, homemade French fries mm-hmm. um, and recipes like that. But when you're going to be using something where there's a lot of liquid, like a super stew, um, you want a lower starch level. So you want to go with that waxy potato. Love that. Love that. Okay. What's next? 
Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring it to a low boil and let it simmer for a few minutes. And we're going to check the potatoes with a fork. So we don't want them all the way cooked through yet, but we want them to start getting tender. Mm -hmm. So you should be able to put your fork all the way through it, but with some resistance. And we're going to keep that going at a simmer. And then we're going to go ahead and add in our lentils and our kale. And the lentils, you know, remember, these are the red lentils. So we do want to rinse them first um, because any kind of dried lentil that you buy at the store, well, technically they are clean and ready to go. Sometimes you'll see there's like kind of a little bit of dust or debris left on them from when they were packaged. So it's a good idea to just give them a quick rinse um, in a colander, like a fine mesh strainer or something. Mm -hmm. And that way you can just, you know, eliminate that, make sure it doesn't end up in your soup. And, you know, occasionally with lentils too, you'll find like a little small stone or something hard in it that's again from the packaging. So you can go ahead and rinse those through, kind of use your hand on it, and that will take away any of that that's left in there. Okay, so you always rinse lentils? Is that is that true? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I think it's just a good idea just to get any dust or anything that's left um, from when it, they were packaged. So, and you don't need to rinse it for very long. It's just kind of a quick rinse mm-hmm. um, just to run the water through it. Okay. Um, so then you'll add the lentils to the pot and then we're going to add some kale. And you can use any variety of kale that you like. So you might want to use like the um, Tuscan kale, um, Lacinato is another word for it, or dino kale. That's kind of easy to chop up into small pieces. It doesn't have to be super small because the kale is going to reduce in size once we add it to the soup and it's going to get soft. But you can just roughly chop it up or you can just use your standard curly green kale that you'll see at every supermarket. Do you take it off the stems first or do you leave the stems in? That's a that's a great question. I do personally take it off the stems because like those stems and the ribs in the going through mm-hmm, the middle mm-hmm. are kind of tougher. Mm-hmm. But that's a personal preference. If you don't want to have those go to waste, what you can do is you can put the stems like chop them finely and put them in the soup first mm-hmm. so that they have a few extra minutes to cook and then add in the leaves. But personally, I discard them. Yeah, no, that's a really good tip. And you just made me realize like like I made the mistake. My, my kids really like a soup. It's a Tuscan soup, actually, that has kale in it. And I usually buy the bunch of kale and then take the leaves off of those ribs. But last time I bought the bag of chopped fresh kale and I just kind of tossed it in there and it had a t- ton of stems and my youngest was like mom why is the kale so hard and so (laughs) what I'm saying is yes cook those stems a little bit longer like Amy said and or don't include them at all and if you get that bag kind of pick through it and pull out or like pull off any that are like a bigger piece of that stem because they're awful yeah absolutely yeah it actually I stopped buying those bags of kale for that reason Mm -hmm. because they are just you know factory or machine cut or something so they don't discard the stems and some of them are really tough yeah so yeah yeah. I mean maybe if you're using the bag kale to make smoothies it's okay because it's going to be all pulverized Mm. but for our soup yeah I think it's a lot better texture without the stems. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, if you are not a fan of kale or if you just don't have any, you can really use any green that you like. Um, spinach is is a great substitute. Mm-hmm. Um, or I like using Swiss chard a lot. That make is delicious in soup. Swiss chard yeah. is my favorite. So- Everybody who listened to the show already knows my favorite vegetable is beet greens. I love the greens oh. that grow on beets. And I just found out maybe a year ago at this point now, they're closely related to Swiss chard. So, yeah. And so there's like a very similar flavor. And that, the beautiful thing about Swiss chard is that like the ribs, the stems are the best part. Like we're talking about yeah. with the kale, like don't eat the stems when it's a Swiss chard. Like I purposely cook the stems for like a minute or so longer and then add the leaves because they're, they're so purple and so much flavor. I love them. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, that's a great tip, too, about you can also use beet greens instead. I hadn't yeah. even thought about that. But yeah, I've also heard that they're very closely related to mm-hmm, the Swiss mm-hmm, chard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so that's that's a good tip. So basically, at this point, we're just bringing the soup back up to a simmer after we added in our red lentils and kale. And, you know, it's not going to take too long to cook the lentils. Like you're probably only going to need about 10, 15 15 minutes now at this point and then everything is going to be tender and you'll see that those lentils um, are very soft and they've turned a yellow color and now all we need to do is just add in a little seasoning because if you notice we haven't added in any seasoning right, yet yeah. so all we're going to do is add in some fresh lemon juice mm. um, so at least a half a cup oh. but if you like a stronger I'm sorry not half a cup at least half a lemon oh. I should say at least half a <laughs> This soup was going in a whole new direction. At least half a lemon. So that's going to be about uh, about a tablespoon and a half. Uh, But if you like extra lemon flavor, then you can add, you know, as much as you want. You can also add the lemon zest. Mm. And then we're going to, of course, taste it and add some salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. And um, this soup, you know, most likely you will need to add some salt at least. So just but I like to add it to taste at the end once everything has really cooked. And that's really it. And you just stir in the lemon juice and your salt and pepper, and then you're ready to serve. I want to ask you why you add your salt at the end as opposed to earlier in the cooking, because I think people do this for different reasons. I'm curious about yours. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So in this case, I like to add it at the end because sometimes when you're cooking with lentils, and you add salt at the beginning or while it's the soup is cooking, the lentils um, don't get as tender. So they kind of absorb that salt and they stay firmer. So since we particularly want the lentils in this soup to be very soft, I like to wait and add the salt at the end. That is such a good tip. And like to just confirm, clarify, if you were doing a potato soup that didn't have lentils, you might have salted things sooner. It's really about the lentils. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can salt as you go along. Mm -hmm. Um, But in this case, yeah, I would say it's because of the lentils that I really like to wait towards Mm -hmm. until the end. This is fantastic, Amy. I love it. Sounds delicious and hearty and like perfect for where this is going live end of October. So just perfect for this season and so nutritious, right? Absolutely. And, you know, if you have extra vegetables on hand that you want, to use up, like say you're making this at the end of the week and you're try- kind of cleaning out your produce bin so that you can go shopping again, you know, you throw in whatever you like. Like the other night I made this soup and I had some leftover fresh green beans and, mm-hmm. you know, green beans don't have that long of a, of a shelf life. So I didn't want them to get all slimy and go bad and have to discard them. So I just cut up a few of them in two to about like inch or more like half an inch between an inch and half an inch slices and I threw those into the soup as well at the same time as the lentils and kale and they were great and Mm. you can also um, if you don't like to use kale or you know spinach or chard like we talked about if you have some extra cabbage Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. collard greens anything like that you Mm -hmm. throw it in Mm -hmm. throw it in you know it's all going to work with the soup well this is wonderful I I am going to, so this recipe is on your website, right? Yes, it is. Okay, so I'm going to put a link to the recipe in the show notes for this podcast episode so people can get to it easily and then they will see your site, Veggies Save the Day. And you also have a vibrant Instagram account. Can you tell people about that? Oh, sure. Yeah. So my Instagram is also at Veggie Save the Day. And I like to share um, different, you know, recipes there, even recipes that aren't on my website. So be sure to follow along there to get some other recipes that I think you'll really enjoy. Oh, so good. Thank you so much, Amy. It was so great talking to you again. Yeah, you too, Christine. It's always fun.
I cannot wait to try Amy's soup. It sounds so, so, so good. I'm going to put the link to the recipe in the show notes for this podcast episode for you, and you can check it out and see what else Amy's got going on at veggiessavetheday.com. As to what is going on in my cooking world, last week I told you that I was taking a hiatus from cooking just until I get back from Italy because things are kind of crazy, except that then there were all these beautiful yellow summer squash at the grocery store. They just looked so, so good. And I have this air fryer summer squash recipe on the cookful that does really, really well. People love it. Gets a lot of nice comments. I really like it. And I saw that yellow yellow squash there and I was like, I need to do some more yellow squash recipes. So I actually think that this week I'm going to be testing some roasted summer squash and a creamy summer squash soup. So I am doing those unplanned. Of course, I've just added to my workload, but I can't resist when there's just beautiful, beautiful produce in the grocery store. I want to get it. I want to eat it all up, you know? As to what is going up onto my sites in the near future, there is a new pork butt roast recipe going up. You need to check that out. I love roasting pork butt, pork shoulder. Those are both so good. So that is there. And also going live this week, it's not up yet, it's going up tomorrow, is the tomato gravy recipe. This is a traditional southern recipe that I found out about because I posted that bacon gravy recipe that went viral, so, so viral. It has been viewed 1.4 million times on TikTok and almost 3 million times on Facebook. If you haven't seen the bacon gravy, go and check it out. I am Cook the Story on both TikTok and Facebook, so you can find it there. But in the comments for the bacon gravy, I think it was mostly on TikTok, a lot of people mentioned that bacon gravy was fine, but their favorite was tomato gravy. And I was like, what is tomato gravy? So I actually asked a couple of them in the comments and found out from them and then went and did some research. And this stuff is insane. I love it so, 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 so much. You have got to try it. It is going up live on the site on December 30th. And I am I'm telling you about it on the 30th on this show as well. So you're going to hear all about it, but I will put the link in the show notes for this podcast episode so that when it goes live, you can get to it or just go to cookthestory.com and search for tomato gravy. You will find it there. And what else am I telling you about on this podcast? This week, you know, I'm here every morning with a new recipe that I talk you through. This week, we are doing a ham gravy, the tomato gravy, a really easy dinner for Halloween night that you can just make quickly for your family that everybody's going to eat for sure so that you know they have something nice and hearty in their tummies so that when they are walking a lot and then eating all that sugar, you know that they had a base in there that was solid and good. You know what I mean? What else am I talking about? There is a bacon wrapped meatloaf in your future. I can tell you that much. Oh, and that pork butt roast is coming up soon as well. So many delicious recipes in your future. I cannot wait for you to hear about them all and try them all. I want to say a big thank you to you for listening and thank you to Amy from Veggies Save the Day for being such an amazing guest. I cannot wait to try that lentil potato soup. So hearty and yummy. Also, I will put all the links to all of the things that I talked about on this show today in the show notes for this podcast episode. You can also get them all if you head to cookthestory.com slash R-O-T-D and you will see down there the link to the episode feature Amy. When you click there, you get all the links and everything that I've talked about. It's easy to find everything. The cookthestory.com slash ROTD is the hub or landing page for this show. So it has all the episodes there. You can listen right there or you can click over to them. And it also has the links for you to subscribe. So if you're listening to this on a phone and you want to subscribe, go to cookthestory.com slash ROTD and you will see the buttons at the top to subscribe, Apple Podcasts, etc. Or just search for Recipe of the Day wherever you listen to podcasts and you'll find it there. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend and a great week ahead. I know I will. I've got a little bit more of the exchange student stuff and then I'm heading off to Italy. Things are going to be great for me for sure with my parents hanging out, eating good food, wandering around. I am really, really excited. I'm Christine Pittman from cookthestory.com, thecookful.com, the all new chicken cookbook and from this podcast recipe of the day. Let's get cooking.